bring one of my favorite people on the on the planet up tonight to share God's word and and my sister Brenda um, one of the reasons the thing I want you to know about Brenda is that she's here tonight not only because she leads at the next level she she practices this this theme tonight about elevating your game as you'll see in a moment but more importantly last year when Brenda came it wasn't about Brenda coming and, and, and speaking and doing her thing. Brenda came last year and brought the word. And then for two hours after the session, as people came behind backstage for prayer, Brenda just, as people waited to be prayed for, and Brenda just prayed and prayed and interceded, and God just moved. She, Brenda, my sister, is not a preacher. She's a minister. She is, she is an example, a, a role model of what I believe you need to, to, to follow after as the next generation of urban leader. Would you give a very warm Urban Youth Worker Institute welcome to my friend and sister, Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil. for Jesus sake and all God's people said amen, amen. well glory a Dios <laughs> you all have been so wonderful I've been sitting up in the balcony for the other sessions and it's been hot worship has been hot your spirits have been wide open and I've been praying for you today because this has been one wonderful full intense spiritually challenging conference amen I mean seminars have been deep you know every plenary session they've come with it and so I just been praying for you because you have been given so much stuff down in your spirit and tonight we want to challenge you to elevate your game and so I've been praying about that God what do you say to folk how do you help them to elevate and I want you to know that anything I preach comes through me first right so God has been beating me up I've been on my face while God has been taking me into the Word of God and so I can't hardly wait to share this stuff with you you ready yeah all right well I want to uh, read two texts of scripture to you uh, and and I want to say that Larry is one awesome man of God not is he just an 
urban leader, I really believe God speaks to him. Each one of these themes, you know, who ever heard of like a one word theme? Engage, elevate, you know, emerge, evolve. But I want you to know, I believe God gave him those four words. And if I could speak to you as a sister in Christ, I would tell you to take those four words extremely seriously. I believe that the Spirit of the Lord gave this conference those four words for all of us. And I really pray that you hold on to them because I think the Spirit is speaking to uh, the staff on this, uh, on this particular time in our lives to get those four words and take them seriously. For Elevate, God took me to 1 Samuel chapter 10. Never preached this before. And so hear what the word of the Lord says. 1 Samuel chapter 10 verses 20 through 24 says this, then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. He brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its families, and the family of the Matrites were taken by Lot. Finally, he brought the family of the Matrites near man by man, and Saul, the son of Kish, was taken by Lot. But when they sought him, he could not be found. So they inquired again of the Lord, did the man come here? And the Lord said, see, he has hidden himself among the baggage. Then they ran and brought him from there. When he took his stand among the people, he was head and shoulders taller than any of them. Samuel said to all the people, do you see the one whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted, long live the king. This is the word of the Lord. In, sec, in, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, there's a New Testament text that I've got to read for you before I can preach. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Tonight I want to share with you from a theme, your, out, your attitude determines your altitude. Your attitude determines your altitude. It was 1986, and I was on staff at Occidental College working with college students as the assistant chaplain. I was an MDiv student at Fuller Theological Seminary here in, yes, Fuller, Pasadena, California, and, uh, and I was helping young people make sense of their lives, very much like you guys do with young uh, youth. I was trying to do that with college students, and God was using me, and I felt pretty good about the ministry I was called to, so I was taking them to a John Wimber healing conference down in Orange County at the Vineyard, okay? Now, this was back in the day, so Vineyard wasn't really well known, and John Wimber's name wasn't well known, and uh, this whole healing thing wasn't really in vogue either, okay? And I kind of went with these students because I wanted to keep them out of spiritual trouble. You know how you go to things and you don't expect to get touched yourself? You know, you the leader, so you didn't go to receive, you went to help your students or your kids. And so I went to receive, to go help my kids but not receive anything. So I went with my students, hung out with them, and John Wimber did something that was something I've never experienced before in my life. He took us on a guided imagery. Now I come from a Pentecostal church background and we didn't do stuff like guided imageries. That wasn't a part of our, you know, church stuff. And so John Wimber said to us, I want you each to get really comfortable in your seats, sit really nice and, you know, get a nice position where you're not uncomfortable, and I want you to close your eyes. And so I did that. And then he said, I want you to imagine in your mind's eye, I want you to see yourself in a garden, just a beautiful garden filled with flowers. It's a beautiful sunny day, and, and you're just surrounded by beauty. Flowers are everywhere. So, I mean, I went there. I imagined myself in the garden. Now, the first thing that should have grabbed my attention was that in my image, I was a child. I wasn't an adult. 
I wasn't 20 something as I really was. I was actually like an eight year old girl. And I had like pigtails in my hair and, and I had ribbons on them and one of the ribbons was coming off, you know? That would have been me, kind of wild acting, you know? Hair never stayed in place. And so I was like a cute kid just having fun in the garden. And then John Wimber said, I want you to notice that in the garden there's a path. And he said, that path is right in the center of the garden. Do you see it? So I'm sitting there in my seat, and I nod my head. I go, yeah, I see it. Yeah, I, you know, my imagination's going. I, oh, I see it. So he, says, so he says, I want you to walk on the path. So I started my mind's eye just skipping on the path, just going. So I'm going down the path, and he says, look up ahead, because right at the end of the path, there's a well. Do you see it? And I thought, yeah, I see it. And he said, on the well, there's a bucket. I want you to lower the bucket down into the well. So in my imagination, I did just that. And he said, bring the bucket back up. So I did. And then he said, in the bucket, there is the blood of Jesus. He said, I want you to dip your finger into the blood and apply it to where it hurts. And then something amazed me, because in my imagination, guess what I did? I dipped my finger into the blood, and I put my finger on my heart. I was shocked, because up until that point, I had no knowledge whatsoever that my heart hurt. You would have thought I was the most self-confident, self-assured, bold-acting sister you'd ever met. I worked hard at convincing people that I had everything together and that I was A-OK. -okay. Yes. I mean, I had plaques to prove that I was wonderful. Yes. I had, you know, I had diplomas on the wall to say that I was a good person. You know, I'd worked hard at trying to be good and how, trying to be perfect. That's why I was in ministry. Hello. I, I was good. I had a good job. I was a good person. I had good friends. I had good stuff on the wall. I had plaques and diplomas. I was in who's who and who's not. I was in all that stuff. And so when I put my finger on my heart, I was like, whoa, my heart hurts? I didn't even know that my heart hurt. It was a weird thing to come to the conclusion after having tried so hard to look like I had it all together to realize that on the inside something was hurt and I never, ever, ever knew it. Did you know that you can even keep yourself from knowing the truth about how you really feel? And so I learned that I needed to have plaques on the wall. I had to have diplomas. I needed to be in who's who and who's what. I had to have that stuff to make me feel good about myself because as long as I had that stuff on the wall, then I was a good person, wasn't I? You know what I had to learn the hard way? I've had to learn over the course of my life that no matter how you try to prove to people that you're great on the outside, what you really think about yourself on the inside will ultimately determine what you become and what you're able to do. That if you're not careful, you can put on the best facade on the outside, but what you really think about yourself on the inside determines whether or not you can elevate to the next level of ministry. Do y'all hear me in here tonight? That's what, it's, what this text that I read to you about Saul is all about. God has really been ministering to me about this guy, so I want to take you into this text and see if I can unpack it. Here in the text, the prophet Samuel has brought all the tribes of Israel together because they're going to coronate the first king. God uh, has heard their request for a king. Israel doesn't like the fact that all the other nations around them has a king. They don't have a king. They feel bad, so they feel like, we want a king like all the other people got a king. Give us a king. Give us a king. Give us a king. Now, that's really a slapping God's face because they were a theocracy. God was in charge. They were under the rule of God. God was the one who called the shots, but they didn't like that. They were like, no, no, no. We want a king. We want a king. And after a while, God relented and said, you want a king? You got a king. I'll give you a king. And so, but to let them know, even though I'm granting your request, I'm still in charge. God didn't let them choose the king. God gets to choose the king. God says, I'll choose. I'll let you know who's on, who's the person I divinely appoint. So they're going to cast lots. And miraculously, God's going to have every tribe of Israel present themselves before the prophet. And the prophet is going to make that 
thing go from tribe to family to person to individual and God is going to reveal his choice for the next king so here they are are gathered together to have the next king uh, uh, presented before the whole of the people of God but when they get ready to 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 find the king they can't find Saul he's not there now it's very curious that he's not there because God has already told him that he's going to be the next king God has already told him I'm going to elevate you man I'm going to take you to another level he is minding his own business doing his own thing he goes to look for some lost donkey his father has a lot of money he's got herds and cattle and his cattle his donkeys go out go astray and can't be found he sends Saul to go and find them while he's going to go find them he realizes he can't do it on his own he searched he's looked he can't find them so he decides to go to the man of God he's going to inquire of the Lord he's going to ask a prophet can you give me guidance can you help me find my father's cattle and so he says is there a seer in this town is there a prophet here and the people tell him hey there's a prophet and he is accurate he does not miss this is a guy whatever he says comes true so he starts to look for Samuel. Now before he finds Samuel, God is already on the case. God tells Samuel, look man, a guy is gonna to come to see you tomorrow. He's from the town, the tribe of Benjamin. He's gonna show up and when you see him, he's the person that I've elected for the king. He's the person I've chosen to be the next king. And when he comes, I'll let you know. And so when Saul approaches Samuel about finding these lost donkey, as soon as Samuel sees him, God speaks in his ear and says, this is the guy I chose. That guy coming towards you right now this is the man I've, I've chosen as the king and so Samuel receives him takes him out to dinner for real he does. He takes him out to dinner. They have this wonderful time, a wonderful meal. And when Saul is getting ready to go, Samuel anoints him with oil and kisses him and says, let me tell you something. God is about to take you to another level. You are God's choice. You're the next king. God wants to use you. And to that, Samuel, Saul basically said, ain't no way. Ain't no way in the world. I can't be the next king. Do you, look, I come from a humble family. I come from a, look, I mean, I'm a humble guy. You know, I'm not the next king. He doesn't believe it. He can't receive it. There's no way in the world that he can believe or conceive that God could use him. Now, I tell you something that's so weird about that. He looked like a king. The Bible says that Saul had every outside qualification for the job. He looked good. The Bible says that the boy was straight handsome. Fine. I read that through it three times. I said, well, he was kind of cute now that the Bible says it. In the King James, it says goodly. It says goodly. In, in the RSV, it says handsome. In Brenda's train, he was fine. He just, he just looked good, you know? He was gigantic. This boy was almost seven feet tall. I'm talking Yao Ming stuff, okay? So he's a big guy. He's a tall guy. He has a commanding presence. Can you imagine if a seven-foot guy walked in here right now? We would all kind of, we would notice him, right? You notice folks who carry themselves a certain way. This guy is almost seven foot tall, and so whenever we see people of that stature of that magnitude of that physical presence they catch our eye you know women kind of look and say yo did you see him you know Saul was that kind of guy brothers envied him you know in the gym you see people that's all pumped up and puffed up and you feel like I'm gonna be like him I'm gonna just pump some more weights because I'm gonna look like that brother you know Saul was that kind of guy you wanted to look like him you wanted to be like him you wanted to be with him because Saul had the kind of presence that commanded attention. He was handsome, he stood almost seven foot tall, he had an athletic frame, a commanding presence, and he came from a wealthy, a very well-respected family. He was no slouch, but you know what? He didn't believe it. No matter what anybody told him, he didn't believe it. Are you hearing me? Saul is going to learn the hard way that your attitude determines your altitude. So when they get ready to crown this guy as king, they stand all together, they start to cast the lots, the lot falls on him, and they can't find him. They look around for him, so much so that they finally said to God, did the guy come here? Is he here? And you know what God says? God says, yes, he's here. 
He's here, but you know where he is? He's hiding among the baggage. Somebody say baggage. I think we ought to talk about that for a minute. No, he's not here in the crowd. He's not here in the conference. No, he's not in his place. He's not in his seat. You know where he is? He's hiding. He's crouching. He's dodging responsibility. He's not wanting to go to the next level because he's hiding among the baggage. So I think we need to talk about this thing about hiding among the baggage. If the truth be told, we all have a little bit of baggage yes my husband and I did a marriage skit one time and it tickled us because my husband is a marriage and family therapist and he and I know firsthand that when you get married you come to your marriage with some baggage yes you do if anybody is in here married you know that after you jump over the broom and say I do and you get home on the honeymoon you discover that you got a little bit of baggage so we decided we were going to do a marriage seminar and we were going to tell the truth so I dressed up in a wedding gown my husband dressed up in a suit and and we had a minister come and we played the marriage march you know and I came in and I had a bag on one hand I had a shoulder thing hanging he had baggage standing at the altar and the people there thought it was a real wedding and so they, they're looking like what is she coming down the aisle with all this stuff and I was dropping stuff and picking it back up my husband was trying to help me with with the baggage and he had stuff and and we were trying to dramatize for people that no matter how cute you look no matter how nice that dress is no matter how much you paid for that ceremony whether people can see it or not you showed up at the altar with baggage yes you did and we had one of the best marriage ceremonies many of the best marriage retreats we've ever had because somebody ought to tell the truth that no matter how you look on the outside no matter what a presence you have no matter how much money you have you show up into everything you do carrying some baggage now some of us got baggage from our family some of our families were just not the best you know they did the best they could but they weren't the best for us and we ended up picking up stuff from them that wasn't helpful my mom blessed her heart was a wonderful person but she gave us the impression that the better you did the more you were loved and so you had to do stuff that's why I had plaques on the wall and diplomas because the more I succeeded the more my mom said that's my girl and so one of the things in my baggage was that I am valuable not because of who I am but because of what I do so it's not by accident that I'm a workaholic because that's something that's in my baggage do you understand that it came from my family some of our family says stuff like you're gonna be just like your daddy you look like your daddy you walk like your daddy you just gonna be like your dad and for some of us our dads weren't the best and that has registered in our head we hear our mom's voice saying you're gonna be just like your father somebody else said you know you're just a big bone girl and you'll probably always be overweight and in our heads we're stuck thinking that's just where I'm gonna be cuz my dad said I'm just big boned and I'm just destined to be overweight I I don't know what your family said to you I don't know what they did or did not do but some of the baggage that we're hiding among is the baggage that came from our folks some of our folks did some things to us that just weren't helpful said some things didn't say some things didn't know how to bless us didn't know how to affirm us didn't know how to protect us let us stay over the wrong person's house one night amen somebody and as a result, we've been in the baggage ever since. The real us has been hiding in the baggage ever since. Some of us are hiding in the baggage of what society has done to, to us. Some of us are, are, are of different colors and different ethnicities, and, 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 and society has said to us that all people like you are this, and all people like you are like that. You're not smart enough. You're not dependable enough. You're not on time enough. You're not this enough. You're not that enough. And whatever they have told us has compromised our ability to believe that we could be real leaders. It's baggage. It's baggage. Some of us don't believe we've got enough degrees, and so we're hiding among the baggage of low self-esteem. We're hiding among the baggage of not feeling like we've been to school enough. We're hiding behind the baggage of not having enough money. I don't know what baggage you're in, but I do know that if you keep hiding among the baggage, baggage from your family, baggage from society, baggage from yourself, baggage from the past, stuff you did that you can't let go, stuff that was done to you that you won't forgive, baggage baggage Saul is hiding amongst the baggage they have to literally go drag this brother out God wants to elevate him 
God wants to use him. God has already said to him, you don't have to do this by yourself. I'm going to empower you to do this. On the way home from talking to Samuel, when Samuel first said to him, God's going to make you king, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God fell on Saul, and he began to prophesy like he was out of his mind. People looked at him and said, is this Saul? He was with a school of prophets, and he was hanging big time. They could not believe the supernatural truths that were coming out of his mouth. And do you know why God did that for him? God was saying to him, you're not going to do this in your own strength, Saul. You're not going to be king because you're worthy to be king or you're strong enough to be king or you got the power to be king. You're going to be king because I make you king. And I'm going to use you as king and my power is going to come over you and my power is going to work through you as king. I just need you to be available, man. But because he couldn't in his mind conceive of himself as being used by God to that degree, when it was time for him to elevate, he was hiding. When it was time for him to say yes, he said no. I ain't going to do it. I don't think I'm the best person for it. I can't imagine myself doing it. And I want you to know something. As much as he looked like the part, Saul had low self-esteem. He could never envision himself as the man that God could use. And if you and I don't deal with our baggage, when God calls you and you and you and you and you and me to elevate our game, we're not going to move. Even if we hear our name called, even if the grant comes straight to our door, even if somebody says, I'd like you to be the next speaker for the conference, we'll find some way to sabotage our ministry because baggage keeps you from standing up and going to the next level. Can you say amen? amen. Baggage will keep you from finding a relationship that's fulfilling. Baggage will make you think you're ugly when you're cute. Baggage will make you settle for a foolish person in your life as opposed to somebody who can affirm you and value you and stand with you in ministry. You'll take anybody just because he'll sleep with you. Even though you look great on the outside, on the inside, you don't believe you're cute enough. So any nut, nut that comes and says, yo, baby, you pretty, we find ourselves sleeping with him. We're thinking, what am I doing amongst this baggage? Why am I in bed with you? What am I doing here? But baggage will make you compromise your success every single time. So I want you to know, I believe this is an, a timely thing for the last thing for us to leave here to say, because I think God is saying, I'm getting ready to use you. I'm ready to elevate you. I'm ready to take this thing to another level, but I need you to start unpacking your baggage because the more stuff you got, the more you keep yourself at a mediocre low level. And I want you to rise up. I'm ready to take you up. I'm ready to do some things. I'm ready to do some things with you. But if you think it's got to be used through Brenda or Larry or whoever else you admire, when he comes and says, it's time for you, you'll find yourself hiding in the baggage saying, no, 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 get somebody else. It can't be me. When I was a kid, I used to go to a church called Emmanuel Tabernacle Church of God. And they used to sing choruses. I never thought we knew a whole hymn all the way through, but, but we would sing choruses, right? And we would tear them up. Now, if I had a tambourine, I could tear it up. And, and one of the songs came back to me for this message. And it was an unusual song in our church because we didn't sing a lot of songs about your mind. But in, in, in our church, we sang a song called Elevate Your Mind, Let's Go Higher. Elevate Your Mind, Let's Go Higher. Elevate Your Mind, Let's Go Higher. Let's Go Higher in the Lord. And the Saints would just be clapping like that, you know, elevate your mind, let's go higher. And we would say, yes, Lord. So we would go there, right? We would be singing, we'd say, yes, Lord. And, and, and I thought about that thing, elevate your mind, elevate your mind, elevate your mind. Do you know that your attitude determines your altitude? That if you're gonna rise up, you gotta think bigger. If you're gonna raise up, you gotta think up, you gotta look up. That saints was on target. You got to elevate your mind to go higher. You, it starts on the inside. It starts on the inside. It starts with what I believe about myself. And that's why God says to us in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, I beg you, emerging urban leaders, I 
plead with you, those of you who came to this conference, by the mercies of God, present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. I think what Paul is saying to you and to me is, if you're going to elevate your mind, you're going to have to come into the presence of God first and regularly. In order to change how you think about yourself, in order to change how you see yourself, in order to change how God, what you believe God can do through you, it begins with coming to God so he can tell you who you are. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Say to God, if you can use anything, you can use me, Lord. I may not be much. I might not be, might be, not be the most intelligent or the most articulate. I might be, not be the most educated. I might not have the most money. But God, I report for duty. I show up. Hallelujah. I'm available. I'm available. I'm available. Lord, I'm available to you. My storage is empty. I don't have much more to give, but I'm here, God. I'm standing here. I present myself a living sacrifice. I lay down willingly, God. Use me. Use me, God. I don't know how you will, but I believe you can. And so, God, here I am, here I am, here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You get to call the shots, God. Here I am, here I am, I'm here. Present yourselves, show up. Show up before God when you leave this conference. Don't wait to have worship when there's a team in front of you. Show up regularly because it's only in the presence of God that we figure out who we are. The Bible says that before we were formed in our mother's wombs, God knew who we were. Before we showed up on the planet, God had a reason for us to be here. Do you know that we wouldn't even be able to look at you if God didn't want you here? It doesn't matter how your mom and dad got together. It doesn't matter on what circumstances it took place. It doesn't matter if you were wanted or unwanted by them. You were called forth by God. He wants you here, and he wants you here now. It's the truth. And I tell you something else. God doesn't have anybody here that he's having purpose for. He doesn't design something and then wonders what to do with it. You wouldn't be present if he hadn't already known why he needs you here. There is something that only you can accomplish, and he's wanting us to get on with it. I love him for that. So here I am, God, fully convinced that you've got something for me to do, fully convinced that there's something that only Brenda can accomplish, something, Lord God, that only I and my makeup and the way I think and the way I look and the way I talk and the way I see life, there's something for me to do that nobody else can do but me. Here I am, God. Present yourselves a living sacrifice. Now, let me tell you something. I've got two kids, a 14-year-old and an 8-year-old, and we read books together at nighttime. One of the books we read is by Max Lucado, and it's about this little a wooden puppet who, who has this low self-esteem because all of the little uh, puppet people keep putting uh, little stickers on each other to say that we're defective in some way, you know? And so every time they see you make a mistake or fall or slip or have a chip in yourself, they come and they put a little dot on you that says something's wrong with you. So whenever somebody sees you, they see the dot. They see the dot. They see the dot. And, and he was always uh, making mistakes. He was clumsy. He wasn't the most beautiful, the most articulate. He wasn't the best one in that little town. And they had dots all over this brother. And then one day he saw a little girl and she didn't have any dots on her. And he wanted to know, how come you don't have any dots? Where, where are your stickers? Where are your, where's, how come you don't have any? And she says, they try to put them on me, but they don't stick. And so, you know, he's like, yo, how you do that? How you get the things not to stick? And she says, I go to the maker. Oh, the maker? Oh, yes. So one day she took him to the maker. And he sat him up on the little bench. And, and he told him that he was made by him and that he loved him just the way he was. And, 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 and that, that he had purpose and design for him. And, and he could hardly believe it. Just like Saul, he couldn't imagine that that could be true. So he left out of the maker's room. But the maker said, come back as much as you want. Come back every day. Just come and see me. Because the other little girl, she goes all the time. That's why the dots 
just don't stick because what God says about her, what the maker says about her mattered more than what the little people said about her. And after a while, that stuff just didn't stick. My God, when he walked out of the maker's door, <laughs> when he walked out of the maker's door, one of the dots that was on him fell off. And he said, this can't be true, can it? Could God love me? My brothers and my sisters, people are all over the place trying to define you and me, trying to tell us who we are, trying to put dots on us. But if we would present ourselves before God on a regular basis, he would redefine us. He would tell us who we really are. He would tell us, I don't care if you preach well or you don't preach well. You're my child. You're my beloved. I have you. I love you. I got a purpose for you. I don't care if you forget every word you were supposed to say. Because I used to fear that if I didn't preach well, I wasn't good. I took plaques down off my wall. I took diploma down because if I don't have no degrees God still loves me if I never go to seminary God can still use me I want you to know God is able to use us and for some of us it means seminary and for some of us it does not and I don't want people to keep putting dots on me how about you I'm tired of them telling me who I am I want God to define me and that's why God encourages us and I encourage you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable before God let him tell you who you are let the dots start falling off of you so low self-esteem can be abolished and we can get ready to elevate the saints were right elevate your mind let's go higher don't be conformed any longer to this world let's be transformed by the renewing of our minds let's think big let's think big let's think big in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ amen hallelujah come on and stand to your feet I want to pray for you thank you Jesus yeah, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. I want to just bless you tonight before I take my seat. I used to love the song, I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I think about it every night and day. Spread my wings and fly away. I believe I can soar. I see me running through an open door. I believe I can fly. I believe I can fly. Now, I want you to know God is about to take this thing to another level. He's going to use youth in a magnanimous way in this next generation. He's going to use us to influence a generation that's going to do great exploits for God. But we can't take people higher until we go higher. You can't lead where you won't go. Now, that was the Lord. <laughs> that was the Holy Ghost. That was free of charge. You can't lead where you won't go. Do you understand? So you can't take people higher if you won't go higher. It's time to elevate people of God. And it begins with what you think in your mind, how you see yourself. And so we need to get a picture of God taking us through an open door. We need to say inside ourselves, I believe I can fly. I believe I can soar. I see me running through an open door. Close your eyes and bow your heads. I need to pray for a few of you. All over the building. I wish there was somebody to play some worship. Is there a worship man close by right quick? Anybody over there that can worship with me? Hallelujah. Father, you're doing a thing in this room, and I bless you for it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I just want to take a minute to bless you. Thank you, Jesus. All over the room, begin to think about what you think about yourself. Begin to think about how you envision yourself. What do you see? Do you believe you can fly? Do you believe God can take you to the next level? I'm telling you the truth. You cannot lead where you will not go. You can't cause kids to elevate if you won't elevate. You got to lead the way. He's asking us to elevate to a next level. He's asking you to elevate in your ministry, to elevate in your personal life, to elevate your spiritual life. And just like Saul, he's not expecting us to do it in our own strength. He's going to give us the power. That's why we've got to show up at the maker. And he's going to give us a spiritual empowerment that will enable us to do things that we never imagined before. Do you see yourself going to another country? Do you see yourself helping AIDS victims in South Africa? Do you see yourself having significant ministry? Do you see yourself talking to politicians on Capitol Hill about the plight of urban youth? Do you see yourself being brought in to give advice to congressional leaders? I'm talking to somebody here. But if you don't see it, every time they call you to go to Washington, something in you will compromise your getting there. I'm preaching to somebody. 
I don't know who you are and I can't see everybody's hands, but if you believe God is calling you to change how you see yourself, God is challenging you to get a bigger vision. God is challenging you to elevate your vision of who you are and what God can do for you. Just raise your hand. Say, God, I hear you. I hear you telling me to step it up, take it to another level. Yes. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Right now, God, I ask you while that song is playing that you begin to give people a vision. They ought to start seeing something different. In your mind's eye, God's going to begin giving ideas even now. Even now, he's going to begin to give you a new thought. As you start to get in your quiet time and spend God time with God, he's going to begin giving you ideas. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. For that person or persons I'm talking about, Lord God, that you're going to have go to Washington, D.C. I pray that you would begin to deal with every piece of baggage in their lives. That when they get summons to go, Lord God, they will not compromise or sabotage their success in Jesus' name. Oh, God. That one who's supposed to travel internationally, God. Who keeps saying they don't have enough money to go. Who keeps disqualifying themselves. God, I speak a word of blessing on them in Jesus' name. The Lord would say, what you lack in money, I'll make up for in favor. Money is not the problem. It's how you're thinking is the problem. You don't need money. You just need a ticket. And anybody can give you the ticket. Father God, I pray that you would take these people far and wide. That you would take them to distant shores. There are people in Guatemala, Nicaragua, there are people in other countries, Lord God, who are waiting for urban youth workers to come and show them how to minister to kids more effectively. There are kids dying all over the world, God, and you're about to deploy an army in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So do so, God. Do so, God. In the name of Jesus, come on and praise him. Oh, come on and praise him. Come on and praise him.